Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this exciting webinar, Supporting Diverse Students, Identifying Colleges That Narrowed Equity Gaps. My name is Hudi Callum Karian. I am a Senior Research Associate at the Community College Research Center. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Andrea Lopez Salazar and Armando Lizaraga, and we're partnering for this webinar with Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. So we'll hear from Matthew Peterson, Bob Van Schindel, and Katie Truly. And each of the presenters will also introduce themselves further when they take the mic. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. You'll note in your toolbar that you have both a chat function as well as a Q&A function. We will be monitoring both of those rooms. Please use the chat function for any comments or clarifying questions. If you have questions about the substance of the presentation that you would like to pose to the panelists, please note that in the Q&A function, we will be moderating a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, and we'll draw from those questions that are listed there. Let me also introduce our respective organizations. Community College Research Center, CCRC, is a research center based out of Teachers College at Columbia University. We study community colleges as well as broad access or your institutions. And for the last 10 years, advising and support services has been one of our core research areas. As I mentioned, we're joined today by colleagues from Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, NWTC. NWTC is a nationally recognized two-year public college serving nearly 27,000 individuals annually. I also want to acknowledge Elizabeth Barnett, Lindsay Lesser, and Lauren Pellegrino. Lindsay and Lauren are not part of our panel today, but we're instrumental in the research that we will be presenting. Okay, so we have a couple key objectives for today's session. The CCRC team is going to start off by providing an overview of the key analytic decisions that we made to identify institutions among a cohort of 26 colleges and universities where equity gaps narrowed. We'll demonstrate how these analyses were conducted and the results of these analyses in the context of a study of advising redesign or IPASS. We'll then turn the mic over to our NWTC friends who will share how they use data internally to inform ongoing and upcoming data-driven advising, student support, and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Of course, our overarching goal is that you folks will be able to take away from this some data analysis strategies that you think will be useful for your internal efforts to leverage your data to better understand how your practices, policies are impacting low, in, uh, low income and racially minoritized students. And if there's any kind of effect on the uh, on equity gaps at your campuses. Let me start with just a little bit of context on advising redesign. Again, the reform context from which we pooled our cohort of 26 institutions for this analysis. So in 2015, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation invested in 26 institutions nationwide to redesign advising. This was part of the Integrated Planning and, Advise and Advising for Student Success, or IPASS initiative. IPASS essentially funded 26 institutions to leverage degree planning, coaching and advising, early alert and risk targeting technologies to improve students' advising experiences and ultimately their, their outcomes. At CCRC, we have studied IPASS since the inception of the grant. We have developed evidence-based frameworks for advising redesign using advising technologies. Our current project is now building on these evidence-based frameworks by focusing in on the practices and policies and cultural changes that may contribute to more equitable outcomes in this context of advising redesign. We came to this project from the perspective that good advising and support programs can be especially instrumental for racially minoritized and low-income students, support students from these backgrounds to achieve their post-secondary goals. So a comprehensive understanding of IPASS really required us to explore these, the equity dimensions of this redesign. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial injustice that our nation continues to face really amplified the urgency for this work. This project is designed in two phases. 
In the first phase, we use student unit record data from the years 2011 through 2017 to identify a set of institutions from among that cohort of 26, where we see some improvement in outcomes for Black, Latinx, and low-income learners. I want to be careful here to note this is descriptive. At no point are we conducting causal analyses. We recognize that the institutions that were part of this cohort have a lot going on. We're taking on a lot and really uh, isolating the effect of IPASS was not the goal. It was simply to use data that we had in hand from previous analyses to identify a set of institutions where some further exploratory qualitative work in phase two could help us then identify promising practices for supporting underrepresented students. So in phase one, we identified six case study colleges. And in phase two, which we're wrapping up currently, we're exploring qualitatively the practices that, um, that, are, that are emerging as instrumental for supporting underrepresented students. Today, we're going to be focusing on phase one. We will share the data analysis process that we went through for phase one and how we came to the six case study colleges that were identified before then turning it over to NWTC, one of those case study colleges, to tell us a little bit more about their internal efforts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea to begin sharing our phase one work. Thank you, Hootie. Hi, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, my name is Andrea Lopez, and I am a research associate at CCRC. In the next couple of slides, I will discuss the first set of decisions in our analysis. So one of the first decisions we needed to make was determining what to measure. Um, we used our theory of change to inform this decision. Next slide. Um, this image illustrates the theory of change underlying the IPASS model, which is essentially how reform is intended to affect short and long-term outcomes. In theory, high quality advising helps students clarify their goals and make better academic decisions to achieve those goals. The whole concept of IPASS is that technology empowers advisors with data with efficient communication strategies that advisors could then utilize to provide intensive support and interventions for students. So in theory, this should lead to improved student success measured by short and long-term outcomes such as greater retention rates, more credits earned, higher grades, and higher graduation rates. For example, advisors can use education planning tools to help students clarify their academic goals and enroll in courses that align with those goals leading to students attempting more credits, especially credits that align with degree requirements. With the theory of change that I just showed you, um, we then determined which key performance indicators or KPIs to consider in this analysis. KPIs are performance metrics that can be tracked, measured, and analyzed over time. We typically use KPIs in higher education to assess how an institution is progressing towards certain goals. Based on this theory of change, we took the perspective that if we were to observe improvements in equity gaps related to improved advising experiences, it would be mostly among indicators that reflect students' enrollment decisions. Therefore, to measure subgroup outcomes and equity gaps at IPASS colleges, we decided to focus on three short-term KPIs related to students' enrollment decisions. The first one is credit momentum, the proportion of students who attempted 15 credits in the first term, uh, credits attempted, the percentage of credits attempted that were earned during the first academic year, and retention, the percentage of students who continue to be enrolled in year two. One of the most important decisions we had to make was figuring out which cohorts we would identify as pre and post. We used the 2012 cohort for our pre IPASS comparison group because this is the first cohort for which all institutions report data. 
As Hootie noted earlier, IPASS grants were awarded in 2015 to 26 institutions, but these colleges were working on advising redesign using technology prior to 2015. So we chose to use the earliest cohort possible when advising redesign was early or not yet happening as our pre-period comparison group. For the post-period comparison group, we needed to identify a period where implementation had been in effect long enough and where we, where we had sufficient data. We utilized the 2015 cohort to calculate retention, and we used the 2016 cohort to calculate credit momentum and percentage of credits attempted that were earned during the first academic year. For each KPI included in our analysis, we used a multiple pronged analytic strategy. For each KPI included in our analysis, we measured the proportion of students within a subgroup who achieved a KPI post-reform, change in outcomes within a subgroup, so how the proportion of students in a subgroup who achieved a KPI changed from the pre to the post period, we compared outcomes across subgroups first, just in the post period, and then over time. We then grouped each of these of the calculations that we conducted into three indices. The number one outcomes for black students, number two outcomes for Latinx students, number three outcomes for low income students. Uh, let me walk you through one index by way of example, uh, to help us understand outcomes for black students. For each college, we looked at the proportion of black students who achieved each KPI in 2016, the post period. Uh, we also looked at how outcomes among black students for each KPI had changed from 2012 to 2016. Then we considered how outcomes of black students for each KPI compared to those of white students in the post period and how that comparison had changed over time. I recognize that there is a lot on this slide, uh, but we will be sharing this PowerPoint with you all. And at this point, I will turn it over to Armando. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Armando Lizarraga. I am a graduate uh, student at the University of Texas at Austin and I worked at CCRC prior to starting graduate school as a research assistant. Now, let me walk you through some of the key decisions we made when determining what students and colleges to include in our analysis. Next slide, please. We first restricted our sample to institutions with at least 30 Black, Latinx, and low-income learners enrolled in each cohort year. That was the minimum number needed for us to be able to do an analysis. Second, next we evaluated the accuracy and completenesses of demographic data, comparing demographic information in our data set with what is reported to IPEDS. We removed from considering institutions with more than 20% of demographic data missing. Finally, we narrowed the scope of the analysis to first time in college fall enrollees for consistency across institutions. Based on these decisions, we restricted our sample to 23 IPASS colleges. We recognize that this analysis has limitations, for example, First time in college fall enrollees are not representative of a broader college population. These were the decisions we made within the parameters of the data that we had on hand and look forward to future analysis that can think about measuring equity gaps among non-traditional students or within departments or colleges instead of just looking at change college-wide. Next slide, please. Our research design calls for comparing across institutions. These strategies may also be useful when thinking about making comparisons within a single college. Next slide. First, going back to the indices that Andrea discussed, we created a scoring a system allocating the point for each KPI calculation for which the college ranked within top five and then totaling those points by index. Next slide. We then again ranked institutions by index with the institution with the highest points per index ranking as one. We then identified the institutions in the top five for each index. 
Our analysis resulted in three community colleges ranked in the top five for each index and three four-year universities ranked in the top five for each index. Next slide, please. Finally, a critical part of our analysis was incorporating qualitative data. Next slide, please. To supplement our qualitative analysis, we developed what we called an institution profile. These profiles included our KPI findings, but we also considered institutional characteristics, findings from prior qualitative data. Remember, we have been working on these with these colleges before this study, so we had previous qualitative data to reference information from the web to reference uh, information, information from the website scans for the DAI efforts from institutions, IPES retention and completions for data beyond the cohort years in our data. We also conducted call screenings with, with the colleges. These calls included conversations with select administrators and advisors to learn more about the college diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and targeted supports for Black, Latinx, and low-income students. Next slide, please. All of the analysis we just described resulted in six case study colleges, Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, Donna Anna Community College in Las Cruces, New Mexico, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College in Niagara, Wisconsin, the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida, and the University of Texas at San, at San Antonio in San Antonio, Texas. Next slide, please. We're going to hear today from one of these six case study colleges. By way of example, one way of the indicators that led us to NWTC were the improvements, the improvements we observed among Black and Latinx students from 2012 to 2016 in terms of percent of credits attempted that were earned both within subgroups and relative to white students at this predominantly white institution. As you know, we're going to hear from NWTC. Let me share some of the key KPI findings for this college that led us to selecting them as a case study site. From this institution that led us to learn more about their efforts. In regards to credits attempted that were earned, we saw a 17% improvement among black students and 20% improvement among Latinx students. We also observed an improvement in equity gaps between black and white students of about 15% and 17% between Latinx and white students over time. I wanna be clear not to overstate these outcomes. It's descriptive. It is college-wide, not specific to a single intervention or even IPES as a whole. However, in response to these descriptive findings, we met with the NWTC team, learned more about the work they were doing internally to understand how their efforts are shaping the experiences and outcomes of racially minoritized students. And we're going to now turn it over to them to tell you more about these efforts. I'm not going, to, going over to turn it over to Bob from NWTC. Thanks, Armando. Um, I thank you, uh, all for It's good to be here. Uh, I'm Bob Van Schindel uh, from NWTC. Um, my role at the college is uh, faculty development consultant, but I'm also here in the capacity uh, today as a co-chair of our diversity team, um, which is a new role for me. Uh, but my partner, uh, Katie Truly, is also here. I want to leave space for her to introduce herself. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for having us here. Um, my name is Katie Truly. I'm an academic advisor at NWTC, and then for the past two years and entering into my third year as the co-chair of our diversity team as well. well great. Uh, next slide. Uh, a little bit about our college um, is that we are, uh, our major campus is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we have three campuses across uh, seven different different counties um, in Northeast Wisconsin, five regional centers, about 35% about of our students are full-time. We have lots of opportunities for, for our students. Um, uh, about a 20% of our student body is diverse. Um, with uh, our greatest enrollment increases are among students of color, uh, which is really pushing a lot of our work in this uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion space. So it's good to see those data, that data that you shared, Armando, from previous years. Um, and we're here to talk a little bit more about like our upcoming transition of, of things on our horizon uh, of trying to get more tightly situated with our data to inform uh, and also just to, to be able to examine the impacts we're, we're actually having with our students of, of color on campus. Um, like Armando mentioned, we are a predominantly white institution in a predominantly white region. Um, and, and so uh, our initiatives have really expanded in the in the last few years that, that I know Katie probably has been more witness to than than I am in my I've been involved with the diversity team, but it's a new role to be a co-chair with her. 
Yeah, absolutely. And as Bob had mentioned, the, and we can actually head to the next slide. Um, the role of the diversity team has really changed over the past few years. And we really see that changing within over the next probably 10 years as well. Um, as you can see, these are some of the areas that we work um, at our college. And so um, we really have started and have for the past few years thought about diversity work in kind of these four different areas, student success, diverse workforce, diversity education and institutional climate. Um, as Bob had said, um, we've had some increase in our enrollments and Armando had mentioned that as well. And we've seen some success there. And then also we have to be responsive and acknowledging that over the past um, two years, we've seen an increase in racial justice and social justice work across the country, but then obviously that has impacted the work that we do at the college. What that has meant is that we've had a lot of engagement from staff across our college in this work, which means that we now, as a diversity team, no longer own all of the work necessarily, um, but our role is moving more into how do we help empower everyone throughout the college to engage in this work while also keeping an eye and making sure that the connections that need to be made are made. Um, so you can see in these areas, we have these four um, areas that we've always focused on, um, but underneath all those areas, these are just actually a sampling. We've got about 50, around 50 different initiatives that we would consider diversity, equity, and inclusion related. Um, so each of these areas um, have different resources or different programs and initiatives going on. And so we've highlighted some that have some um, data that we are gathering and trying to identify what do we measure and how do we measure and how does that then inform our practices? Yeah, and, and to date, uh, in some of those examples, like that, for example, that first high wage programs, uh, it really is, has been informed and it's been a responsive practice to this larger long term metric to increase the percentage of our students that are in high wage programs. And um, as that work continues, uh, trying to get a little bit more granular uh, in how we what data we collect and how we're being able to note the impacts a little bit more in the short term. Uh, so it allows those programmings to be more responsive in those spaces. Uh, again, we're we're new to this work, and this the, these roundtables are have a, been a structure for us to try to get our arms around everything that's happening, uh, and it's daunting to think that fifty that is a lot of initiatives to to attach some metrics to, um, but trying to be real focused on where where we're where we can go um, and what's making the most impact for our students. Yeah, and so Bob mentioned these roundtables. So quarterly, we now are having all of those initiatives report out um, to the entire college. So everyone from the from the institution is invited, and at those report outs, what those what those groups are doing is they're sharing what the work that they're doing around whatever initiative it is, and then also giving an opportunity to ask for help. So bringing more people and engaging more people in the work, um, and hopefully connecting the right people to needs across our campus as well. Yeah, and, and for the, just for purposes of our examples, a couple other examples in that diversity workforce, we've instituted employee resource groups with the intention to increase the retention of our employees of color because we noticed that's a gap for, for us institutionally. Also um, implemented in the diversity education space, uh, uh, required training for all of our faculty and staff to go through what it means to be living, teaching, and serving inclusively uh, with the intention to reduce gaps in course success rates uh, across all of our racial ethnic groups. And then finally, that last bucket of our institutional climate, we have employee climate surveys, we have student climate surveys, um, and using those to inform um, how we can better address experience of exclusion um, and, and spots of a continuous improvement for, um, for our students. And so uh, those are just a couple examples of, of uh, the initiatives we have going on. We can move to the next slide. So as we've mentioned, our work has changed and we have so many more people engaged in the work. So the question now is what, what is the role of our diversity team? We're not necessarily the main drivers of the work, um, the work, so to speak. So what can, what can we do and how do we better leverage that team and the expertise of those individuals? And so 
we see ourselves moving into a place of consultancy across at our institution and then better able to use data to help all of these other initiatives, the departments, our learning, um, our HR department, any office on our campus, um, how can we better support them in incorporating a lens of equity into the work that they do? Right, and we're not we're not alone in, in this in this work uh, for sure. Uh, on the left side, we're thinking about the different inputs into the diversity team of of being able to seek out where are our data points, where are our um, data gurus on our on our campus, what metrics are we looking at, and and having those feed um, into our diversity team so we can um, really be knowledgeable and and data informed as we make recommendations as we make uh, communications and updates to to the rest of the college. Um, and so there's a couple of really strategically important teams that are a part of this work, uh, one being our, our uh, dream core team, um, because we are an Achieve the Dream leader college. Uh, we do have a group that is all about student success and their movement into being a lot more research based. Um, and, and another group that's doing some work is this strategic retention team, which is was led by uh, our own Matt Peterson, who, who's done some really great work of desegregating data, uh, of, of developing some processes and, and uh, some frameworks for our team to think about, um, or the entire college to think about. And with that big question of, once we notice these equity gaps, now what? What do we do? Uh, and trying to position that diversity team to help answer that question. Um. And, and just a quick note on this, um, when we talk about partners, the other piece of that is our college leadership. So we have a new role, a, C, a chief, diverse, or chief officer of diversity, equity, inclusion role that was instituted at our college in July of 2020. So a newer role at the college. Um, and so we're still figuring out you know, some of that structural piece. But again, we have all of our executive leadership team is invested in this work and also our other leadership teams as well. So there, we're trying to create an environment where everyone is working towards the same end, um, evaluating, evaluating data, evaluating research, um, but also doing it in a way that makes sense where we can all be influencing change the way that we need to be. Yeah, and, and with, with that, I wanna hand it over to, to Matt Peterson, our manager of student retention at NWTC to highlight some of the, the more granular work that, that he's been doing. Hey everybody, thanks for this opportunity to speak today. Thanks Bob and Katie for, for giving a really good overview of, of the diversity and equity inclusion work we have going on at NWTC. And um, I thought I would take it a step further with two examples of how we're using the power of disaggregating data further to improve some of the interventions we have for students at NWTC. My name is Matt Peterson. My title is Manager of Student Retention. As part of that work, I'm charged with evaluating the retention initiatives we have here at NWTC with a very specific focus on closing equity gaps. Um, I also manage our early alert system, which since 2013 has been Starfish. So I'm choosing today to, to speak about two examples related to early alert. These are important. It's important, I think, for, for all of you listening to know, these are not interventions where we yet feel we've nailed it. Uh, uh, I chose these two examples to speak on today because I think that they provide an opportunity for us to um, show how further disaggregating data is leading us to ask better questions. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of an overview of our early alert system at NWTC. I mentioned we use the product Starfish. Um, we have a system like most early alert systems of flags. Uh, the, the goal here is to of course identify students that are struggling early before their the deficits are too large to overcome and we have a couple of major flags that our faculty and in some cases our non-faculty staff raise. Uh, you can see them on the slide there, uh, a participation flag and a current grade flag, very vague general terms. Um, and then 
more detail can be added to the message so that uh, it can be tailored to each student. But we, we try to raise these as early as possible when we see a student struggling um, and then try to intervene with that student. Of course, raising a flag itself is not an intervention, but it should spur some intervention with the student uh, as soon as possible after that to get them back on track. We're also fairly unique at NWTC in that we raise a lot of kudos messages within our Starfish system. Uh, kudos are raised, again, primarily by faculty, but also by non-faculty staff to tell students that they're on the right track to be encouraging and motivating. And something that has made NWTC fairly unique over the years, at least among, uh, among colleagues uh, at other colleges that use Starfish, is that we actually raise a lot more kudos then we raise flags. We consider this a best practice for promoting student retention and student success and building a sense of community. We've known this about ourselves for years. However, we haven't always uh, aggressively disaggregated the data to see if this is true equitably across all student subpopulations. So uh, we, we made a realization in fall 2020, next slide please, um, we looked at how many kudos were raised per flag across some of our student populations. And as you're looking at this data, this is again from last fall, that magic number of one is a, a kudo to flag ratio of one, meaning for every kudo raised, there's a flag raised. Or you can think of it in, in more simple terms, every time a student receives a piece of what might be considered bad news, of course it's meant to be supportive, but it's news that, that they're, they're struggling, um, they're getting one piece of good news as well. And you see across uh, all students in our population, that first bar, a ratio about 1.6 kudos per flag. That's, that's where we would like to be, is raising more kudos, more supportive messages for our students than, students than messages that the students are, are struggling. However, across our different racial and ethnic groups, that's not always true. In our American Indian Native American student populations and in our Black African American student populations, we see in fall 2020, the ratio is under one, meaning that those students are receiving more flags than kudos. Um, we see also some, some differences between our Asian students, our Hispanic students compared to our white, our white student population as well, um, which has a ratio near two it really led us to ask some good questions. We did not immediately assume um, that this was necessarily reflective of implicit bias among our faculty, although we can't exclude that possibility as well, but it really led us, think about, led us to think about what, what kudos do we make available for staff to, for staff to raise um, and how can we make uh, for a culture in which kudos don't necessarily represent good performance, but might represent actually uh, the right to students taking the right behaviors and steps to be successful. Because if kudos are only raised when students are being successful, we're really just reinforcing and entrenching equity gaps rather than um, maybe challenging them. So if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, we, we reimagined our suite of kudos for spring 2020. And we we launched this right in the middle of our spring 2021 semester between our first session and our second session. You'll see here that we, we, we kept the same flags uh, that, are, that, that we've always had available, but we, we changed and added some new kudos messages. So we changed the good work kudo to focus on great effort, um, thinking that that is something that we can really enforce for a student who might not have a B or an A. Maybe they have a C, maybe they have a D, but they've moved upward from a, from a low D to a high D and they're approaching that, that C magic passing mark. We added a couple of kudos for students just doing the right things, using their resources or a kudo for students that have a C, but they're really trucking along and they're doing okay. We call it the on the right track kudo. And then the last one you'll see there um, probably my favorite, probably the one that touches all the feels, is that you can do this kudo, um, which is meant strictly to be an encouraging message for students um, when maybe they're frustrated. And I'm really happy to, sh to show you or to share with you that once we launched these kudos, 
we saw at the end by the end of spring 2021 and of course we don't have all our data in yet from fall 2021 but so far we see across all racial and ethnic groups that kudo to flag ratio for every group is now above one we still haven't achieved equity in terms of of every group having the same ratio but now every group that we see is at least getting more kudos than flags and we think that's a really important part of our sense of belonging here at NWTC. I can also share that these new kudos, these kudos that you see in blue on this slide, disproportionately have tilted toward our students of color. So um, we think that we've made some progress and I'm sure that when we get our fall 2021 data in, we'll, we'll see that we've got more work to do and we'll continue to tweak these messages. But um, this is not a question we would have asked or an or a effort we would have launched had we not disaggregated our data back in fall 2020 and, and asked ourselves some tough questions about whether our system was really built to challenge these equity gaps. Uh, the second example, next slide please, that I want to share is from our new student intake survey, which is I kind of think of it like our earliest of the early alerts. So this is a survey that we give our students around the time that they complete orientation. So they haven't probably started any classes yet, um, but we ask them about some of the non-cognitive and the life issues that could potentially cause struggles down the road. Our, our whole goal here is to help identify students who might have these struggles and reach out and intervene or at least make them aware of our services before before they even step foot in the classroom and have a challenge. So um, just to give a couple of examples, some of the questions on our intake survey uh, ask like, do you, do you have enough food every day? Do you have uh, secure housing? And if students answer no, they receive a supportive reach out from our student support services area to at least make them aware of the services that, are, that we make available. Um, and, and possibly, hopefully, get them hooked up with those services. We ask questions about, are you sure, how confident are you about your career choice? Um, how confident are you about your ability to use technology? And many of these questions have a particular service area for which those students are referred if they indicate a struggle on this new intake survey. We then track as our data point positive clearing, which is what we say uh, occurs when a student has an, an intake survey referral raised and cleared because we actually spoke with a student and they had a meaningful conversation with us and maybe started some services. Or a negative clear, meaning we were never able to make contact with a student who had an intake referral raised. Not surprisingly, we've been tracking this for, for multiple years since we launched our intake survey in 2016. Um, students that receive service from us after they have an intake referral raised have better student outcomes. Those outcomes include better retention, better credit ratio, which, which we use the data point, the, the percentage of credits that they attempt that they actually complete successfully, and even better first term GPA. So we're really looking at that positive clear as a sign that the services that we can offer them the student before they start, um, they, they do seem to make a difference in at least establishing knowledge of our services and building a sense of community. However, until this, this year, we have not disaggregated this data to see if this is an equitable response uh, across all of our student populations. So if you can move to the next slide, please. This is a little bit of a, a busy data slide, but I just wanna talk you through it really, really slowly here. So the blue bars represent the admit term GPA, the GPA of a student in their first term, if they had no intake referrals raised at all. So those blue, those blue bars represent students that, at least on our survey, did not indicate uh, significant barriers to student success. The gray bars represent the admit term GPA of the students that had at least one concern raised on their survey, but never actually spoke to us. And then what we're really interested in is that orange bar in the middle, which are the students that had at least one referral raised and spoke to us, actually had a positive touch point with us before they started their classes. We're looking to see if we're closing the gap 
between the blue bars and the gray bars when we make these interactions with students. Overall in our student population, the answer is yes. The, orange, the students with orange bars perform almost as well as the students who have no concerns raised on their survey. But you can see from this data point, from this data slide here, that it's not equitable across all student populations. We seem to be closing the gap more in our white students and our Asian students than we do in our Native, and Native American and Black or African American students. And what we realized from looking really hard at this data is, and I made a little red box here to really emphasize, our Hispanic and Latinx students, this particular intervention at least, is not making a positive impact on them. That's leading us to ask some really difficult questions and I have no answers as of today. We really have started tackling this. What resources do we have at NWTC to help us assess not just whether an intervention works, but whether it works for everybody? And then the really hard question, what do we do when we realize it's not working for everybody? As you can see from this data, that this is not necessarily an intervention we wanna throw out. It's it's having some really positive impacts, but we've got some work to do and some tough questions to ask about how we are perhaps reaching out to these Hispanic students. Are we structuring the conversations in a way that's sensitive to this group of students and having the most possible effect? Or do we have more questions to ask in the data? Um, so we're, we're in the process of trying to answer this difficult question, but I'm really proud of the the new process that this is opening up at our college, which wouldn't have been possible without disaggregating this data far enough to, to make these realizations. I should say here for, for data gurus too, I chose to show the data slide here, which is admin term GPA, but actually our persistence or retention data and our graduation data and even our credit ratio data looks very similar to this across these different groups of students. So, it's not just that GPA is not moved for Hispanic students by, by this intervention. We really see it across all of our, our metrics. So um, I believe that we will be moving now into the question and answer portion of, of the presentation. I did see a question asked about our intake survey uh, as I was speaking. It is conducted in Starfish. And then the system of referrals is built into Starfish as well. So there's one question maybe that, that we knocked out. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Matt, very much. And yes, we will be moving into our Q&A. If the panelists can all turn our, our videos and um, Elizabeth, I'll turn it over to you to help moderate this session. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, everybody. That was um, a great presentation. Um, I think I learned some new things and I work at CCRC. I'm um, Elizabeth Barnett. I'm a senior research scholar at CCRC and um, want to get to the questions that we have posted. And if anybody wants to add any more, you know, please, please go ahead and do that. So first of all, Huri, um, can you talk about how you landed on 30 as the Black and Latinx enrollment threshold used in the analysis? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, so that we um, was, an there's an element there of just, you know, having to identify a number where we felt sufficient, um, that, that we had sufficient number of students there where we could do, could do some work. Um, we were not planning on doing any statistical analyses. We were really going to something very descriptive. Um, and so in consultation with other colleagues who uh, work more with key performance indicators that felt like a threshold where we had enough information that um, that we could do do some analysis. Um, we also wanted to um, limit the sample as as um, you know we, we didn't want to narrow the sample all that much. So thirty and more seemed to be the place where we could include as many institutions as possible in the analysis without. Um, getting to a place where we just did not have enough. Now, one thing we did not note is that we looked for that number across the cohort years. Um, so it often was the case that we had a significant number more. Um, it's just that we would have one cohort year where there where we were getting in that in that low range, and um, um, and we, we we wanted to be thoughtful about whether or not we could include the institution in that case. So um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's also a comment here. Um, it's more of a comment, but maybe 
um, one or more of the panelists want to, to, to respond. According to Dr. Ivory Tolson, to really close out equity gaps, we have to compare intra-group versus between groups. If you can close the gaps between the highest and lowest performers within a specific demographic, you can make gains on overall equity gaps. And as long as you continue to compare between groups without changing the environment, the gains will be minimal. I, I'll just weigh in and say I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. And I think that's what we're trying to be a little bit more intentional about. Um, and I think that that's that leads us to an uncomfortable place where we're going to find that some of our some of our interventions that we've really held close and held dear uh, as being effective are not as effective for all students, and that that will lead to some uncharted territory. At least that's what we're finding at NWTC. And there's another comment that maybe is related. I think for Hispanics, it's very important to re recognize diversity within this culture. So. Thanks for that comment. Um, also, for yeah. I'll just add there that 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 point, the intersectionality, um, which is I think what that last comment is alluding to, was really one that we grappled with. Um, and ultimately, it, you know, there, there is an element where we are um, we were limited by the data that we had and the way that students had been categorized in in our data set. Um, but we certainly are uh, are um, exploring more ways as a center on how to address that intersectionality in future analyses. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and for, for our opportunities, uh, thinking about, uh, that's a great question, right? How, and it leads to more data collection, like how can we get into that larger group of, of students who have identified as Hispanic to, to get at their qualitative experience, for sure, to be able to inform more of our, more of our things. So uh, yeah, I agree with that comment of getting, <laughs> getting deeper into that, toward the indiv individual. And this, this question is related to, have you conducted focus groups to see how students feel about the kudos or if they pre prefer other kinds of contact? Uh, I, we have conducted focus groups. It's been a couple of years now um, and, and probably could dust those off with a more of an equity lens than we took in 2017. We've conducted extensive surveys as well. Um, Many of those survey respondents are anonymous, so disaggregation has been difficult. Overall, I can say that the, the response across NWTC students to kudos and is a remarkably positive, much more so than I think um, many would expect at the college level. Um, kudos sometimes have a little bit of a, a flavor to some of a gold star or um, perhaps almost bordering on childish. That's totally opposite of what our students tell us. They, they tell us actually, you know, I, I, I continue to come back to what one student told me, which is that was the only nice thing anybody said to me that day <laughs> when they got a, a short message from a faculty member that just said, you're doing great. Um, so that's very anecdotal, but something like 70% of our students who receive a kudo say that they feel more a part of the community and more willing to speak to their faculty members after kudo. The other 30% don't say that they feel worse. They just say it didn't make much of an impact. So, but I do think that we can come back to that question now with more of an equity lens and make sure that the wording, the approach, the messaging is, is delivered in such a way that it's impactful for as many students as possible. Here's a related question. Is research available indicating that the use of kudos alone has a positive impact on student success and retention? That's been a difficult question for us to answer. Uh, certainly there's a very, very strong correlation. Um, our data tells us that students that receive kudos are much more likely to be retained, to be successful in their classes and to succeed. A little bit of a chicken and the egg. <laughs> question there though, because generally students who receive a kudo received a kudo because they were doing well. Um, so a little bit of little bit of a difficult question to answer without some bias built into the into the data. But for us, we see even with flags, even with students that receive a flag, those that um, you know, and again, I just want to remind people when they receive a flag, it means that things weren't going very well generally. Um, those that have their flag cleared after intervention are much more likely to be retained and to be successful 
than students who have a flag and don't receive intervention. So we don't we we can't dismiss the data just because there's there's question around it. It just needs a little bit uh, of a careful analysis. Yeah, that's great. I think yeah, I'll just add from literature that I don't know of any research that specifically focuses on kudos, um, but in general, there has been some positive research around use of flags to um, as, as an intervention. And from the work that we have done in prior IPASS research, um, especially just even in focus groups with students at institutions, uh, when you build a culture around early alert flags that, um, that elevates the um, the role of a kudos, it becomes something that students, you know, can, can uh, look forward to, that students even talk about with one another. Um, so just from that qualitative perspective, um, I think there is, there's a lot to, to gain from it. Great. There's another question about faculty training. Curious to know in reg regards to inclusivity training with faculty and staff campus-wide, did you outsource that? Or how, or did the college staff in this department handle it? Uh, a great question, great question. Um, so that was actually built internally. Um, so it was something that we we worked across uh, cross functional teams. Uh, we do have some um, diversity instructors who kind of took a lot of the lead uh, in the content areas, and then it's been a uh, an ongoing continuous space of improvement for for our. Uh, because as we've evolved as a college uh, to, to infuse a little bit more challenging spaces uh, in there for sure. Uh, and it's grown from a really foundational space of, of, a, of a level one uh, to include more level level two orientation for, for faculty specific, um, staff specific, and then leader specific. So it's been built internally among that group, but definitely with, with the resources that, that we've gotten from, from folks um, externally as well but we've um, brought in folks to to kind of help skill us up in certain areas and then leaned on some of those resources as we've had that common experience so great question and just to provide a little bit more detail on that um, all staff at nwtc are required to do a 20 hour and we call it living inclusively and then if you're faculty you would do a, another 20 hour um, teaching inclusively, and then student services and other staff are required to do what's called serving inclusively. Thank you. So this is for CCRC. Um, were any of the institutions CCRC examined predominantly Black or Latinx serving institutions? And if so, did any of the outcomes stand out for you at these, at these institutions? Yes, they were. Um, the institutions certainly ranged in, ter ranged in terms of the proportion of Black and Latinx um, students that were enrolled, but we absolutely did have um, did have institutions that were um, that 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 had um, that was pre predominantly served Latinx or Black students, and um, several of them did emerge among our case study case study colleges. Um, the numbers that we previewed for NWTC are comparable to the outcomes that we observed um, at, at those institutions um, as well. Um, so that, if that's helpful, but we're able, we can provide some additional detail if that would be helpful on what those outcomes were at the other case study colleges. But yes, there absolutely were. Great. So for NWTC, um, have you implemented any programs aimed at helping students increase their sense of belonging at the school? If so, did you find those strategies helped with student success? Yes, um, certainly we have um, a number of different programs. We have obviously student organizations, um, but two things that really come to mind, and Bob, you can fill in other things as well. But one, we have a RISE leadership um, program that invites um, primarily Primarily, it was first targeted at students of color, but really it has expanded to any student um, to come and engage in, in discussions and leadership discussions and leadership trainings um, that also discuss equity and discuss um, what it is to be a leader in a diverse space. So that's a leadership development type program. Um, but the thing that really comes to mind that I that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think is a um, you know, targeted necessarily as a program, but it was really an initiative across the college campus. Um, we as a college campus were partnered with IPASS 
to institute a coaching training model for all of our academic advisors that then expanded into all of our student facing staff, including our faculty. And so implementing a coaching model in how we work and engage with students. And so that was a process that started, I believe, in 2016 um, and then has now just become part of our culture and part of our onboarding with all new staff and faculty as well. Yeah, and the only, uh, I mean, at some point, all of our initiatives are, are intended to impact, right? That we're trying to create a create a space, a climate that's conducive to belonging, right? Because we belonging can't be created. We create a space to, to help folks. So in, in that aspect, like even our uh, initiatives to um, recruit more, more faculty of color, uh, it, trying to match our student populations. That's a really in, important aspect of, of, of having folks in this space that uh, students can see themselves in um, more, more areas and, and more spaces. So that's a, that's, a, that's a big initiative at the college. Um, but then also rethinking some of our, uh, our first year experiences for, for from some of our students, uh, students of color and uh, some of like the high wage programs, uh, getting some more um, infused advising into those spaces. We have another a program called Next One Up, which is really uh, trying to build a community in that first year, specifically with students of color in our business, our college of business space. So um, lots of things uh, going on to try to create that space and trying to create connection, which for those who are maybe in that community college or, or commuter college space, that's a that's a hard thing to, to get connections with folks. But um, but we're at that point, like we mentioned before, of trying to get our arms around the data that goes with that. Like we have all these things, and then okay, how what are our what are our indicators of impact uh, for those for those students, and that long term, that short term, and then all the questions named about well, how do we get more into what is it about this intervention that's helpful for certain students from this demographic? Um, so yeah, lots. Yeah, good for you guys for, for using data so extensively. Um, Matthew, there's a question also about the intake survey and how that's actually managed. We, we deploy the intake survey through Starfish um, and periodically about once every two weeks or during periods of, of really extensive orientation activity, more like once a week. Um, I, I, along with a couple of other folks, go into the survey and raise referrals based on the, the responses that are given. Um, <clears throat> and those referrals are then sent to a number of different service teams who are using the coaching methodology that, that Katie referenced to reach out to those students and welcome to the college. And we really coach our staff to treat that call as a welcome to the college. Um, you know, really trying to be careful of that this does not mean that you're in trouble. It does not mean that you have less of a chance of being successful. It's, it's the opposite, um, that we want to welcome you here, make you feel um, feel welcome, and make you aware of our services. So this is really early data. In fact, the survey is still open, but we just sent out a survey to the students who responded to the intake survey this fall. And we had 90% of the students that had responded as of yesterday saying that they felt more welcome after that call than before. The other 10% said it didn't make much of an impact. Nobody said it made a, a negative impact on them. So we're really trying to make sure that there's only good that comes from that call. Um, sometimes it involves calling students multiple times uh, and texting them and emailing them and you know their lives are complicated. So there's a persistence element of our staff too. Don't give up. Let's, let's really find these students and meet them where they are. I think we have time for one more question. Um, for CCRC, have you done research on the impact of representation both inside and outside the classroom? That's a great question. That is certainly a, ta uh, a theme that is emerging from our um, qualitative work in this phase two of the project. Um, we've not done anything, you know, anything um, by way of measuring impact, but that certainly will be um, a theme that emerges and uh, that we will cover in our, our upcoming paper in the spring. So certainly each of the six case study institutions um, raise that as an area of development. Um, and even the institutions that predominantly serve Latinx or Black students 
um, felt that there had a long way to go in terms of uh, addressing representation in, in the classroom. So uh, we'll absolutely, absolutely cover that. Well, Huri, do you want to close us out? Yeah, thank you everybody so much for joining us. Um, we will be sharing the slides and you can feel free to, uh, to distribute as you like. Um, thank you for the questions. If there were any additional follow-ups that you have, I will share. Um, well, when you see the slide deck, you will see you have our email addresses. So please feel free to reach out and we're happy to continue the conversation. Thank you.